Praise God. He makes the impossible possible. For with him, according to the text, there is nothing impossible. What is impossible for men is not impossible with God. Somebody say amen to that. I'm turning your attention today to the book of Joshua. Allow me to say thank you to Indiana Bible College and all that have worked hard. So thankful to receive that clip from yesterday's rehearsal after a dozen hours of praise and worship and practice. There was a prayer meeting that hit this room last night and they begin to worship God and the Holy Ghost was poured out in this room. We thank God. We thank God for talent and for process, but we thank God way more for his anointing and for the power of the Holy Ghost. If you're a visitor, we are so thankful to have you with us on this snowy January day. Thank you for braving the elements uh, and being with us here at Calvary Tabernacle for our home church folks, our regular Calvary members. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. We do have several that let us know they couldn't make it this morning. They'll be here this evening, but due to a little bit of travel, and we want them to be safe. Many are watching online. We want them to be safe and be blessed. And those that are battling sickness today, we want them to recover. Amen? I agree with what Brother Gallion was saying during our time of prayer and the power of our prayer. He is still a miracle-working God. Amen. I want to say thank you before I begin to read text. Thank you so, so many. I was, in fact, overwhelmed. I told my wife this week I was overwhelmed by the amount of people who reached out to let us know that you were praying for us this week as we ministered abroad and as we were preaching there to other preachers, pastors, evangelists, and leaders. And we thank God for the Holy Ghost and the work of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for your prayers. The Lord blessed us there mightily. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. None went out, none came in. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make that long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Jump now to verse 20. So the people shouted, when the priests blew with trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. The same Thing that the Lord had told Joshua was going to happen. Um, I want to preach today on this, on this title, Walls. 
walls. Turn to someone near you if you're willing and simply tell them he's preaching about walls. <clears throat> As is our custom and rightly so, let us pray before the word. God, we love you and we thank you for the reading of your word, for the timeless truth of the text. And we pray that you would make our hearts and our minds ready. Let our ears hear clearly. Let my mouth speak clearly. Help us to receive from your word as I know you have so placed upon my heart to relay to your people today. I pray we would be better and stronger and closer to you because of our time together in your word. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus and let everybody shout amen. 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 God bless you and you may be seated today. Again, I state clearly that my topic is walls, walls. It was on September 8th, September 8th, 2022, at our Mid-America Revival Conference when I preached a message, when I think of Jericho. And I compared blind Bartimaeus and the New Testament New Jericho with the Old Testament Joshua account of walls falling. Today, our structured journey, after two weeks ago, preaching about those 10 negative voices versus those two positive reports of Joshua and Caleb, and then a week ago dealing with marching into the Jordan while the banks were still being overflowed because it was a time of harvest. We find ourselves now today in the place of promise with Jericho in front of the children of Israel. But today we will evaluate more than the intimidating walls of Jericho. And if you will so allow, for how many recognize in this house that the preaching of the word is always at the allowance of the listener? The preaching of the word of God is always at the allowance of the listener. The word of God does not touch your heart. It's not because of the word of God. If the word of God does not touch my, now it might not touch my emotions. There are times that the speaker does not do an amazing job on, on keeping our attention. And if I ever do that, I apologize. It's happened before. It will happen again. It may be coming to a stage near you. But when we stand on this platform and do our very best to relay the word of God, ultimately it is up to the hearer. And so while we will look at the intimidating walls of Jericho, I think subsequently we will look at other walls of history. But maybe and more importantly, we should consider walls in our personal lives. It is easy for us to preach and consider and even shout about the walls of Jericho. And it is nice for us to travel back down through our world's history and consider the importance of walls that have both been erected and have fallen over time. But it is not nearly as painless to evaluate the walls of our own life. But I believe it is our assignment here today. There seem to be maybe none in our more recent world history than that from 1368 when Tu Ang Long or Hu Hung Wu, easier named the founder of the Ming Dynasty in China, began an expansive project which would be gone to be built and it would be recognized as the Great Wall of China. You see it here behind me, that great wall of China that for the next three centuries expanded to some 13,000 miles long, including more than 25,000 towers, each protected by a permanent garrison. What was this wall's main purpose to prevent that large scale Mongolian invasion. The Great Wall of China stands as a great example of the numerous walls that have been constructed 
throughout human history. And for those in this room that have never been to China and you have never seen nor walked near these great walls, if you see the picture, you're able to call it immediately to recollection if you were sitting at a test table today. Now, many of us in this room don't want to even ever think about taking a test again. But if you were sitting there and this picture was shown and you had a multiple choice and the Great Wall of China was there, I would say probably we would score at the 100 percentile because of its notoriety, its notability. You would recognize that to be the Great Wall of China. Not all walls are defensive in nature. Some walls have been built and designed to keep people in. A case in point, many in this room lived through would have been the infamous Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall separated East Germany and West Germany for nearly three decades. It became the symbol of the Iron Curtain that separated Western Europe and the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. It was ultimately a barrier to progress It was a barrier to the unification of a nation at a critical point during the Cold War. Then President Ronald Reagan uttered these words that have echoed through the following decades when he said, and many of you are already ahead of me, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Over the next few years, the shockwaves of Reagan's words reverberated, becoming a rallying call. And the wall indeed fell. Its fall ultimately led to German reunification on October 3rd of 1990. And as important as walls can be, history has shown, yes, some walls need to be built, but some walls need to fall. I want to say that again so that it is crystal clear throughout all of this room today. History has proven to us some walls need to be built but some walls need to fall, to which I would even try to deduce reasoning down to this logic. It depends on the motive for the wall. What is the motive and what is the purpose for the wall? Now, for many of us, we have heard of the walls of Jericho as long as we can remember. We can remember childhood stories about the walls of Jericho. I have had fun at times preaching even to this local congregation about walking and marching and being in services where we march around. And we have even done that here. And we understand the strength of the scripture. But I want us to take a little deeper look into Jericho here today. I want us to consider as I was As I was studying through this and praying through this, I I couldn't really stay away from the archaeology of Jericho and even the fall of Jericho. For archaeologists have worked to debate the timeline of Jericho's destruction and whether there was actually even a fortified city when Joshua, in fact, shows up on the scene. When was Jericho actually destroyed according to archaeology? There have been significant debates among the archaeologists and the theologians about that timing of its destruction. There there has been this back and forth game, if you will, mainly tied to a couple of eras, the late bronze and the middle bronze era. Now, for some of you in this room, that means nothing. For others in this room, that's intriguing. And for many of you, you're indifferent either way. But if you'll allow me simply to make this statement to you today, there will always be people who work with severity to discredit the scripture. We need to be aware of the enemy's devices. And even people who would say, well, they are pure in their motives. I I would tell you anyone that is trying to take the truth of this text and make it lesser or make it questioned. Remember the... The initial understanding of Satan, the subtlety of that serpent, came through the questioning of the Word of God. 
And if we're not careful in this day and age, we will elevate scientific study to a place where we try to denounce the truth of Scripture as we weigh it against scientific study. I'm a theologian that would stand here today. I'm an individual as a minister of the gospel and with my training, and I would say science only continues to prove the truth of Scripture. This word is forever settled in heaven. Individuals like Ernst Sellin and Carl Watzinger led that first major expedition to Jericho in the early 1900s. It's amazing, actually, around the 1907 mark when, and just for the next handful of years, they would be excavating while the gospel was really spreading and starting to move. It just happens to be a little coincidental for my message here today and the spread that was taking place and moving this early modern Pentecostal movement is what it would be called here into the Indianapolis area. But while they were there and they were doing that archaeology work in Jericho, they were going to conclude, in fact, that it would be that Middle Bronze Age and, and, and it would be a, a, a kind of a debate that would happen. What was, what was happening, those that thought it was the biblical date of 1400 versus the that are going to say it's the Middle Bronze Age of around 1550. And most with integrity admit the destruction dates have a variance of up to 600 years. I know I'm boring some of you. Stick with me for a second. John Garstan, who excavated from 1930 to 1936, dated this city to the late Bronze Age, that 1400, and it seemed to uh, uh, agree with that biblical date. Garstang found Egypt scarabs, those Places in Jericho Cemetery demonstrate the city's cemetery was in active use during the time that, that Kenyon believed that Jericho was abandoned. That's Kathleen Kenyon, another archaeologist that came on the scene and wanted to begin using something called, called carbon dating, some more familiar than others, and really wanting to debate and work against. And, and so we have this strong debate debate mainly between people like Kathleen and and then Bryant Wood and there seems to be this this fight for what is truth on this chronological scale whether it's the 1400s or whether it's the 1550s into the 1600s and and for some of us we would say well that doesn't really matter well it does matter if you care about the time of the kings and the judges it does matter if we believe that the truth of Scripture matters and the chronological order of Scripture matters. And I, I feel it in, in the room even right now. Pastor Carson, where are you going with this? I don't know that it really, but we're talking about 1400. We're talking about 1500. We're talking about 1600. What does it really matter? Let me deduce it this way. How about if someone walked into the situation of your life when walls in your life were either erected or destructed or some, some seismic significant thing that took place in your life and they then tried to debate with you when what happened? I would tell you this. This scripture has been proven time and time and time again. It's been proven, I, I gotta, I'm going real slow on purpose, stay with me. Time and time and time again. Because whether they want to try to work the miraculous out of the text or not, there were in fact 10 negative spies and two positive spies. Whether they want to work the miraculous out of the text or not. I, I said this here some time ago and that two weeks ago when we were talking about it. It was the Red Sea, not the Reed Sea. I had some people that study scripture reached out to me and said, hey, thanks for bringing that up. Not anyone talks about that. Why does that matter? That matters when you get in a conversation at work and somebody in the cubicle next to you wants to denounce the miraculous. Uh-huh. And then last week when we're talking about them walking with the ark into the Jordan River and the waters being receded and their 
pulling back and it's different than the Red Sea. Now it's the walk in. But here we are standing at Jericho and people wanting to say, and there are archaeologists and theologians that want to come in with a low view of Scripture and a, uh, a removal of biblical timelines and say, when Joshua, when Joshua walked in, Jericho was not even a fortified city. It was, it was not as strong. It's more embellished than, than what actually happened. It wasn't that big of a deal. I, I, I bet I know who would beg to differ. Joshua. <laughs> I bet Joshua would have something to say about the walls. I believe that there was a Rahab. I believe that there was whispering inside the walls. I believe that the walls were so thick and were so intimidating. And all it takes is a cursory glance throughout the Old Testament or even a quick Google search for you to find that it was the, in, in fact, it was the process to begin to build walls around the city. I, I couldn't give you one or two or three. I could give you dozens, if not hundreds, throughout the pages of this text that it became known that a strong city had a wall. And when they get to Jericho, I want everyone in this room to know when they get to Jericho, regardless of what anyone ever tries to prove or tell you, Jericho was fortified and Jericho was strong and Jericho was overwhelming, but they had this truth. God is more powerful than Jericho and God's word is greater than the... Yeah, God's word is greater than what we are coming up against right now. Jericho was real. They did not walk up to Jericho when it was already a smoldering ash heap. They did not show up at Jericho and straightly take the city and then say, let's pretend it was bigger than it was. Let's pretend it was a greater victory than it was. However, if, we can, if I can bring this down to where you live, it's the same thing that happens in the modern day church. God does a miracle for somebody and before you can ever even share the testimony, the enemy of your life has already tried to tell you, I think it was the doctor, not God. It wasn't that big a deal anyway. I've had people come to me and say, I wanted to share my testimony, but it wasn't that important compared to somebody else's. That's a lie of hell. Your Jericho is worth talking about. Your testimony is worth sharing. Your situation... I wasn't at Jericho, but I've had some Jerichos in my life. I wasn't there that day, but I've had some situations in my life. Part of my, part of my message today is just telling you what I think you already believe. Brother Herbst, I know I'm preaching to the choir. We talked through some of this archaeology yesterday. I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit right now. I understand that. But I want to just tell you right now, they did march around the walls. Yes, they did. They did march around the walls. And Brother Brzezinski, I'm going to tell you as sure as I'm standing here, it did not make sense. You know, we romanticize it. We've turned it into something that is beautiful. They walked around the wall. That's crazy. <laughs> Can we be honest about this? They marched around the walls. It did happen. It did occur. And on the seventh day, how many times when they marched the seventh day? How many times? And it did not make sense, but it was the will of God. And they did blow the trumpets. The ram horns were blown. And when they blew those ram's horns, the people did, in fact, shout. And we preached about it again recently. So why, Pastor, are we back here at the walls of Jericho on this journey? Why are we here? We need to hear about something today. The city needed to be taken because it was within the promise of God. This entire month of January, we're on this faith journey talking about accepting, receiving, and implementing the word of God for the promise of God. I want to say it again, the word of God for the promise of God, whether it makes sense or not, whether it's a Red Sea, whether it's a Jordan River or whether it's Jericho's walls, your enemy will look different at different seasons, but the word of God will keep you, whether it's a sea, a river or a wall, whether it's a sea, a river or a wall. 
Here's what will be your sustaining factor. What is the Lord saying about the context of my, my situation right now? What is God saying? For the Red Sea, it was going to be the staff that was raised over it and it would be separated. Remember last week, what was it for the Jordan River? It would be the Ark of the Covenant and they would walk. Those priests would march out into it. And yet now here we are at a place where the entire body is going to be told, don't say anything. They played the quiet game for days. And they marched around. How many had ever been in that trip somewhere and you play the quiet game? And what that really being interpreted from the Hebrew is mom and dad's sanity game. <laughs> yes, Lord. Barely get in the car. Are we there yet? I'm there. If there's a breakdown, I'm there. For seven times around that wall, they were not to speak. They were not to talk. Joshua knew that there was to be no doubt that would come from their lips. Sometimes, you know, the old, the old statement when we were growing up, we were taught if you have nothing good to say, say nothing. Sometimes you need to just convince the enemy by keeping your negativity shut up. By keeping that negative tongue in your mouth. And even when it doesn't make sense to you, just walk. That's why how many know there's times we walk into church when we don't feel like it. Some of you got up this morning and when you saw the snow outside. I bet I'm not the only one who saw the snow outside and thought, oh Lord. You could have given a son. There would have been more people. But what, but what did you do? You got up. Put your suit on. Because this walk. and This walk has to be true. And sometimes I got to shut my mouth. When I have something positive to say, I want to lift my voice. But when I have something that would be disparaging in the situation, there are times that we have to close our mouth and simply march forward and walk on and move in what we know God is asking us to do. And the Lord spoke to Joshua and Joshua spoke to the people. You tell me, did everybody in that group really believe if we march, these walls will fall? Tell me their precedent for that, Brother Liam. Tell me their precedent precedent that if they walk, walls would fall. But sometimes we've got to blindly follow whether we've ever seen it done before or not. Just walking on the Word of God. Just trusting in the Word of God. Just believing in the Word of God. God has put something in my spirit this last week while we were at this conference about even dealing with addicts and individuals who are bound. I am more aware than I have ever been before. There are some parts of this process that are just putting your boots on and walking forward in the process. I'm going to tell you right now, it's powerful when you get a word from God, but it was quite the distance between a word from God and the walls falling. Let me ask us as a church today, who are we in between when God speaks and when the walls fall? Who are we in between when God gives the, the, you the pronounced truth that a miracle is coming and that long season of time before the miracle actually comes? I want him to find us marching forward. What were they doing? They were just standing and marching on the promise of God. Wait a minute. There was no positive report. I'm going to tell you, I believe with all my heart, there was not at the end of that first day when they walked around the wall. I don't think anybody heard a crack or a crumble in the wall. I don't think there was any cracking or crumbling to testify. Oh, just keep doing it. It's really going to pay off. In fact, all the way to the end of it, I think they walk six times on that seventh day and they hear nothing and they feel nothing and they see nothing and they've got nothing else to go on but the Word of God. And that, man, I feel a challenge in this room this morning when you can't see it and when you can't feel it and when you can't hear it. Who are you? Who are we? I tell you what we are. We're believers. We're believers. We're believers. What about when... What about when liberal theologians say, well, you know, that Bible isn't real. I tell you what we do. We march on in the truth. What about when some scientific discovery tries to reason away the miraculous? 
I told someone even today in this altar, as I prayed with them for cancer, he is still the healer of cancer. I know there's scientific research otherwise, but I've seen him do it, and I know he can do it again. But what about when you're not seeing it? What about when you're not hearing it? Wait a minute, they couldn't even talk. So people with a positive voice, we talk a lot about public and, and, and even private affirmation. Brother Faulkner, somebody just come up alongside of you and say, good job, come on, let's keep doing it. What about when you've even been commanded, there's not even affirmation that's occurring. They've been told, don't say anything. So there's not even anybody in your ear whispering, let's keep doing it. Let's just keep trusting. Let's just keep believing. Imagine with me, we don't ever talk about this. This is the boiled down truth of what it must have felt like in the day. Nobody's encouraging me. I never even heard from God. I'm trusting that Joshua did, but I didn't hear from God. Now we're walking around this wall. You know we've got to look silly. These people are probably laughing at us on the inside. All the while, there had already been a revelation from in the walls. We know that the Lord has given you this city. But the people aren't allowed to talk and so no one is ministering to the other. No one is speaking to the other. No one is telling them, come on, if you'll just be encouraged, if you'll just be strengthened, if you'll just keep walking. So my question for us today, who are we when no one's encouraging us? Who are we when no one is embellishing us? Who are we when no one is strengthening us? Who are we? I should... I showed up, I showed up this morning. I wouldn't embarrass him for nothing. He's just, Brother Ranking does an amazing job with our, with our parking lot and our sidewalks and the salt. And I showed up and the first person I see, Brother Brad Titus is over there. It wasn't 8.30, I don't think yet. And I look over, I, I heard him as I was coming down the street and he's working sidewalks over on that way side. Not our immediate stuff, but working salt on the sidewalks all the way over there. Who's going to show up when it's snowing in January and cold and lots of reasons? Why work all the way over there? And I, I know this isn't why you were doing it, and I'm not trying to embarrass you, but over there just working those sidewalks, and I knew what I'm preaching this morning. I know what I'm doing here this morning. What about when there's no one there to thank you and give you a high five and, and tell you... What about spiritually? When you know if I'll just do what I'm supposed to do, I believe that God is going to send the people at the right time. He's going to send the answer at the right time. He's going to send the healing at the right time. He's going to send the deliverance at the right time. He's going to make these walls fall at the right time. He's going to allow Jericho to be destroyed at the right time. We are going to take this city. We are going to... Sometimes when nobody will talk to you, you got to talk to yourself. Come on, David said he encouraged himself in the Lord. I know I'm not the only one that every now and then I got to just tell me you can do this. You can do this. You can live for God. You can be true. You can be righteous. You can be pure. There had to be that internal battle. Will God really give us Jericho? Will he really, will he really give us Jericho? I want it to settle for a moment because we all have a Jericho. We all have a Jericho. Whether you're a, you're a young adult and it's the relationship you're holding on to that you know you shouldn't be. Or whether you're a married person Spouse, and it's the relationship you're entertaining that you shouldn't be. Or whether you're here today and it's the debilitating disease that continues to stand in front of you. Maybe it's the job that for whatever reason you're marching, but you're not getting anywhere. It seems to me that one of the most overwhelming parts of the entire process would have been that they marched so long only to end up back where they started. And I guarantee I'm not the only one in this room that's ever felt like you were walking faithful only to end up back where you started. I've been marching, I've been working. I've been trying to be faithful. I've been doing my best. 
I've been march. I've been putting one foot in front of the other. And yet here come the negative reports. I've been marching faithfully. And yet now it's a Red Sea. I've been marching faithfully. And yet now it's a Jordan River. I, I've been marching faithfully. And yet now it's a walled city. And must it not have been in that moment. The same negative report of all those decades earlier. We're like grasshoppers. In their sight. Oh yes, a preacher got up at a platform and preached to me that we are more than conquerors. But he, he doesn't understand Jericho. And I went to a camp meeting and, and with the right vocal expression, he, he stood up and said, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? But I, in the context of my situation and saying, Jericho is against us. If God can be against us or can be for us, who can be against us? This situation, this circumstance, this trial, the fact that our entire society is trying to make Christianity a bad word. And we got people that think we're not doing enough if we don't do enough socially. And we got people that think we're not doing enough if we don't do enough humanitarian. And we got people that think we don't do enough if we're not seeing the gifts of the Spirit. We got people that think we're not doing enough if we're... And if we're not careful, we, we see these Jerichos that rise up all over. And, and, and we say, let's just get in our little bubble and have good church and pretend there are no Jerichos. But there are Jerichos. There are Jerichos right now. Brother Watkins, as sure as we're in this room right now, there are Jerichos in our lives right here, right now. There may be old walls that have fallen, and if we have the opportunity, we will look at them and use them as a testimony and as a memorial. But the reason for my archaeology uh, description here earlier, let me now bring some sense to it for you. The same people that would look back and try to draw strength, there will be people that want to sift through the rubble and say, I don't know how big of a victory it actually was. I don't know that the timing is everything that they said it was. And, and we draw strength from some of the old miracles of saints from days gone past and people that are in this room right now. You've drawn strength from years and, and maybe even for decades from the testimonies of great-grandparents and grandparents and even mothers and fathers and elders of the church. And if we're not careful, there will be people from today that go back and take a look at them and say, I don't know that it's everything they said it was. I've heard them talk about brush harbors. I don't know that it's everything they said it was. That, that Agnes Osman, I've looked at some of that writing. I don't know that it's everything. <laughs> I, I, I've heard about Charles Parham. I've, I've read the books and I look back, and I, but I don't know that it's everything they said it was. And, and they were healed of cancer, and I know that, but I look back and I really think that it was the chemo. Oh, it's, it's quiet in the room right now, and I'm so glad it is because I want hell to hear me real clear. If it wasn't for the Lord on our side, if it wasn't for the Lord on our side, you hear me right now. If the doctors helped us, we thank God for it, and we thank God for the knowledge that he gave them and the books that they read and the tests that they took and the studies that they, I, I, we thank God for it. If, 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 if the doctors were a part of it, then we say, thank you, God. For, I'm, listen, I bet I'm not the only one that's ever said, thank you, God, for a good doctor. And I've had people in my life criticize me for that. I've had people along the way that said, if you were really a man of faith, to which I said, if you were really a person of common sense, and I'm not intimidated by that. And I refuse to be intimidated by anyone that wants to make our testimony less than what it is. Because every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. How many remember that that, that, that light, it shines in the darkness. And the Bible says the darkness 
comprehended it night not it means that the darkness could not evacuate it and so here's what I here's what I propose on this Sunday morning is that if you have any testimony at all you ought to go ahead and let the rubble of Jericho speak to the situation of your life in fact elders all over this room I want you to hear something we draw strength from the fact that he has brought you through and that he has kept you you might be dealing with a current heart situation or a current lung situation or a I'm not sure what your current is, but I know what Jericho says. Jericho says, if he was able, he is able. I said, Jericho says, if he was able, he is able. And so regardless of your situation today, I would mention to you that you should remember, he is still able. He is still the great I am. Yes, He is. He is still Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He is still Jehovah Nisi. He is still the banner that we hang over this thing. That we say, when the enemy comes in here, our banner reads, Jericho fell. Jericho came down. The walls did crumble. And the Bible says that straightly they went up and they took the city. And archaeologists have found that. It seems as though the city was overtaken with expedience and quickness. And while they didn't hear a crack in the rocks or in the walls for all of those days and all of those laps, when it came time for the walls to fall, they did in fact fall flat. And the people went up straightway into the city and they overtook the city. I believe those that were living in the walls died. I believe those that were taken, yeah, you follow it. Rahab and her family saved alive. That's who saved alive. And there is a testimony from the destruction of those walls. And Jericho did in fact fall, not by sword nor spear, but by the shout and the faithful marching of the people of God that marched on his word and shouted his promises out. And the walls did in fact fall. But the Lord has sent me here on this Sunday morning to ask us a question. If walls are for two purposes, two purposes, two purposes, whether they be walled cities or not from the Old Testament or the New Testament. And we can trace them from the Old Testament all the way to Revelation, the walls of the cities. We can follow them. But walls serve two primary purposes, to either keep out or to keep in. And in my prayer for this congregation today and as I laid before the Lord, the Lord kept asking me a question to ask you which I will now ask everyone who will hear me what walls are still up that should not be in your life? What walls are still up that should not be in your life? I have gone on record and I will be very clear today when I tell the college all the way to the eldest saint in this room. We need walls that keep sin out. We do. We need walls of prayer. We need, wall, we need practical walls. If you and your family and your kids are going to be on electronics, I think you need a, yeah, you need a firewall to guard your personal identity, but you also need a covenant wall to guard your spirit. I believe that. You need restrictions. I believe that. And so I think we need to build some walls. I think as parents, we have the right to build walls around who our kids congregate with. Yes, I do. I think we have the right to build walls. I think we have the right to build walls against where we will work. I think we have the right to build those walls that are both spiritually and physically guarding us. I believe in that. But I could not, I cannot, even in this moment, I'm trying to be calm and even ask you this because I cannot get away in prayer when the Lord just kept moving on my heart and my mind and kept telling me there are perimeters of hearts that have walls that were built by hurt and not His will. Some under the sound of my voice here physically, maybe some online, and maybe some not in this room that need to hear this question. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it all the same and make some statements all the same. You were hurt by a preacher along the way, and now you have such resentment for leadership that anytime something said that crosses you just a little bit, that old wall, 
You were offended somewhere along the way by a parent in your life. And maybe, I believe they were probably wrong. I'm not, please, some are wanting to say, well, you don't know. And I feel that coming out of the room right now, even as I say it. Please hear me. I believe they were probably wrong, and they probably did you wrong. But I will tell you, it was just as wrong for the enemy to allow you to construct some walls of hurt and some walls of offense and some walls of trial that now they guard a quarter or an acre or a place in your heart or in your mind. And so you'll show up to church and you'll say, well, I like this, but I don't like this. And I like if he preaches about this, but I get annoyed if he preaches about this. I, I like when they greet me, but I can't stand if they greet. I'm sorry, this is so normal. This is who we are as people. And we got little walls and some of us don't recognize it. But it's the walls of cynicism that we've built that we look at everything with a questioning eye. And we can't even live happy and everyone wonders why do they act the way we do. It's because we will not let the walls be broken down. We will stand with the masses and march against Jericho. But we won't let even the Lord knock down the wall. I come to you in the Holy Ghost, men and women of God, and I tell you there is no wall of past offense that should, that should be able to drag your soul to hell. There is no wall of past hurt and past anguish that, had, that should have the ability to make you walk through church with a question and make you walk through life with pain and make you deal with situations. Everything runs through the filter of bitterness. Everything runs through the filter of hurt. And for some in this room, you've done it so long you don't even recognize it. But the Lord's given me a word that if you'll open to Him today, He will help you evaluate the constructed walls in your heart and in your mind that have been keeping you from actually being surrendered to Him. This is a surrender process. It is to the will of God where we've, we've got people that think they have no walls and so they have no self-control. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 25 that a man that has no self-control is like a city with no walls. And the truth is it's, it's that, that illustration. There's no walls so there is no governing. But the problem with some of us is that our lack of self-control it, it, it comes out in ways where we get bitter easily or we get frustrated easily we get angry easily and we're, we're, we're Christians in public but we're terror in private come on I'm pastoring right now we can shout and raise our hands when everyone else is but if we could really see it couldn't be seen on an x-ray machine and you couldn't find it on an MRI but if we could get some spiritual evaluation of the heart if we could get deep in there and we could somehow throw it under a contrast there would be these little segments of our heart or these little segments of our mind that because of offense or because of wounding we allowed these, these walls to be built and those walls there's little people that stand on, the, on those walls and they say things like this I I won't be hurt again by a preacher. I won't be hurt again by a father. We got women in this room right now and you don't want it and you don't mean to but it's been constructed around your heart and you've got walls and, and any time that you feel any sense of frustration or offense there's this little thing from the wall of your heart that says no man will ever talk to me that way. I need you to I need you to pray with me in the room right now. I feel like God wants to do a little surgery in this room. If you don't feel like praying right now, it might be you I'm talking to. Help us, God. Easily offended, I'm talking to you. Quick to fight with your spouse, I'm talking to you. Quick to be mean with your kids, I'm talking to you. I want us to really pray for a couple of minutes in this room. I'm asking everybody to pray so that there would be unified liberty in this room. Mm. Huh. <laughs> mm. 
He's trying to heal that old place in your heart right now. You know what? Stand with me. I want to keep preaching through what I feel, but I think we're at a place to stop and pray. When my dad had a heart attack a few years ago, it was a new education for me to spend time interacting with the doctors and with the reports about parts of the heart that can die. I'll never forget Brother Mass and Gail as we discussed that when the doctor said, you know, there are situations though or when it's opened up properly, those dead places can begin to live again. <laughs> I, feel a, uh, I feel a word for somebody in this room right now. There are some places of your heart that have been locked off. Walls. Don't know why you can't really have deep and rich and meaningful relationships. There are walls that have been guarded and there are dead places. I'm asking the blood of Christ to begin to flow again. I know it's been a long time since that first prayer meeting of repentance. It's been a long time since you've heard about the blood. It's been a long time since that abuse. It's been a long time since that neglect. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. But the Lord told me he's come to help break down the walls today. But the, but the truth is, in this situation, we've got to let him. We've got to let him. Jericho was not lacking a word from God, a promise. From, they had that. But they had to be willing to march. And they had to be willing to open their mouth. The hardest part about this whole service happens right now because this altar call is not for everybody. If it's not for you, I want you to just stay where you're at and pray for those who come. But if you're here and you know there's just this spot, there's just this place, there's just this walled area I got over the Red Sea. I got across Jordan. I felt the presence of God. But I've got this Jericho. I need you to be willing to march. And He needs you to be willing to open up your mouth. I'm opening this altar area right now for... Anyone who would say, I don't want these walls. You're not a bad person. You're a good person. You're a godly person. It's just old hurt. It's just old hurt. Come as close as you can. Kneel, pray, stand, whatever you want to do. If this is you and you say, I want to, but I don't want to go down there okay. Maybe just march somewhere near you. Find another pew if that's more comfortable. But I'm asking everybody in the room to pray right now that walls that need to fall would fall. And that healing that needs to occur would occur. <laughs> 